You're watching Tag TV. You're watching Tag TV. Hello and welcome to Newsweek South Asia, a program that talks about breeding of terrorism and its impact on South Asian nations. Let's begin with the headlines first. Pakistan Army continues attempts of infiltrating terrorists through LOC. Hamza bin Laden dead confirms White House. After US called off peace talks, Taliban wreaked havoc in Afghanistan. And Pakistan humiliated globally for sponsoring terrorism. A latest report by Indian External Ministry reveals that over a dozen Kashmiri civilians have died in more than 2,000 cases of ceasefire violations by Pakistan this year. All ceasefire violations by Pakistan at the line of control are unprovoked and are carried out with a single agenda of infiltrating terrorists into Jammu and Kashmir. Today, Pakistan stands exposed even more than before as its infiltration attempts at the LOC have increased significantly, a report. Pakistan has attempted to push nearly 60 terrorists into Kashmir since the abrogation of Article 370. Its army is using latent routes to infiltrate terrorists into India, which is being supported through continuous ceasefire violations along the LOC by Pakistan army. According to a latest Indian External Ministry report, there have been a total of 2,050 unprovoked ceasefire violations by Pakistan Army in 2019, in which the ministry said 21 Indians lost their lives. In the tactics of infiltration, what the terrorists actually do is that this is done in close collaboration with the army. Army sends its guides to pick up these terrorists from within Pakistan or within POK and bring them to the forward posts. And in the forward posts, there are hides constructed for these chaps to come, spend a couple of days and wait for an opportunity to cross over the line of control. Mm -hmm. And in the process of crossing over the line of control, the procedure adopted is firstly, the Pakistan Army regular forces will carry out fire on the Indian posts, automatic machine gun fire, quite heavy volume of fire, so that the Indians, their heads are kept down, they have to take shelter. And then they also put dummy people to create a situation to draw the attention of the Indian defenders in a particular sector. And then attempt the infiltration from another sector. So that is the tactics they use. And of course, over the years, we are fully aware of the Pakistan tactics of infiltration of terrorists and we take the precautions. So apparently, this was one of those attempts that the Pakistan army was uh, using to send terrorists into India, and the Indians have foiled that attempt. Indian army released the latest video of Pakistan-backed infiltration attempt this week. The video shows a failed infiltration attempt by a squad of Pakistan's border action team along the LOC. In the about two-minute video, at least four bodies could be seen, which the army sources said were of Pakistani intruders. According to Indian army sources, Pakistan attempted infiltration in the same area on intervening night of September 11 to 12 and September 12 to 13. The then army commander categorically stated that Pakistan is trying to do huge amount of infiltration in Jammu and Kashmir, and every time when they make an attempt to infiltrate, they are absolutely mowing, mowing the infiltrator down. But now what they've started, they've started using the civilians of POK as cannon fodder, as a dhal, as a shield. Behind that shield are the infiltrators. So that initially when we open fire, it is the civilians who get killed, and the Pakistani infiltrators then turn back and run away. So this is cowardice of the ultimate variety. Using civilians as a shield or cannon forward is something that a military never does. 
it's only a coward who does it. And Pakistan is displaying down, downright cowardice. Just a few weeks back, Indian Army had arrested two lashkar e Toiba terrorists who hailed from Pakistan and were infiltrated into Indian territories to carry out terror attacks in Kashmir. Since the time India abrogated the temporary provisions of Article 370 from Kashmir, Pakistan has deployed extra forces at LOC and there have been reports of terrorists being spotted across forward locations of the border. Moreover, Pakistan's Prime Minister Imran Khan, through his speeches, is trying to provoke Islamic extremism across the world and create an anti-India rhetoric which seems like an indirect approach of boosting the morale of terrorists. This week, the White House confirmed the death of Hamza bin Laden in a U.S. counter-terrorism operation in the Afghanistan-Pakistan region. Hamza was the son of slain Al-Qaeda leader Osama bin Laden. Designated as a global terrorist by the U.S. two years ago, Hamza was seen as an emerging leader of Al-Qaeda until he got killed in the U.S.-led counter-terrorism operation. We bring you a report. Putting an end to a series of rumours and speculations about Al-Qaeda leader Hamza bin Laden's death, the White House finally announced this week that Hamza bin Laden has been killed in a counter-terrorism operation in the Afghanistan-Pakistan region by the United States of America. In a statement from US President Donald Trump, the White House confirmed his death and claimed responsibility for the attack that killed him. Killing of uh, Osama bin uh, son's, uh, Osama bin Laden's son is a clear indication of the fact that now America is serious. America couldn't care less about the role of Taliban. America is not going to give a lot of importance to Pakistan initiative and Pakistan trying to trap America into a into, uh, uh, network. So therefore, uh, I think it is a good development. And not only Osama bin Laden's son, but I personally feel that the time has come when the leading nations of the, of the world have to identify who are global terrorists, like Hafiz Saeed, Salahuddin, uh, Masood Azhar. They also need to be targeted and they also need to be liquidated if the world has to enjoy the peace. The younger bin Laden had been viewed as an eventual heir to the leadership of Al-Qaeda. The group's current leader, Ayman al zawahiri had praised him in a 2015 video that appeared on jihadi websites, calling him a lion from the den of Al-Qaeda. He was named a specially designated global terrorist in January 2017. Later, he had released audio and video messages calling for attacks against the US and its allies. To mark one 9-11 anniversary, Al-Qaeda superimposed a childhood photo of him over a photo of the World Trade Center. Killing of Osama bin Laden's son by U.S. clearly indicates that despite Pakistan's continuous lobbying in the States and its strategy of using the condition in Afghanistan to its own advantage, America will continue to demolish all the terror institutions which are functioning under the umbrella of Pakistan since status. I think it's a good sign that America is now taking a very proactive role in trying to ensure that jihadi culture, terrorist culture will not be accepted by the great nations of the world, firstly. Secondly, who was Osama bin Laden? Responsible for destruction of World Trade Center, responsible for death of many, many Americans, responsible for transforming peace and security environment of America. And he was rightly killed in Abbottabad when uh, American uh, US SEALs, naval SEALs, came in Apache helicopter and they killed him. Now, uh, this person, who, son of Osama bin Laden, was also on the same path as a, that of his father. She said, there's another angle to it, that America is keen on withdrawing from Afghanistan. Pakistan is trying to maneuver the entire issue by saying that they can play an important role with regard to Taliban coming closer to United States. It is just a ploy, it is, it is a trap in which America should not walk in. Pakistan will never think about for the, the welfare and security concerns of America, never. They will only try to maneuver and lure America into such a position 
where they, they are able to extract maximum from America in terms of financial aid and uh, diplomatic support. The statement issued in President Donald Trump's name gave no details about time, place or technique used for killing the ire of Osama bin Laden. The U.S. government had announced a reward of $1 million in February this year for any information leading to his arrest. Hamza's father, Osama bin Laden, was living in Afghanistan since 1996, from where he had declared a war against the United States of America. During his active years, Osama enjoyed the patronage of Pakistan's army and its notorious spy agency, ISI, that was supporting him in all his terror endeavors in Afghanistan and outside. The Taliban terrorists are on a killing spree in Afghanistan ever since the United States has called off any further peace talks with Taliban. A slew of suicide bomb blasts are being witnessed all over the country, killing dozens of security personnel and civilians. The Taliban terrorists have continued to carry out near daily attacks with presidential elections due at the end of the month. We have a report. In the wake of collapsed peace talks with the United States and just over a week before Afghanistan's presidential elections, Taliban suicide bombers killed at least 48 people in two separate attacks in Afghanistan. One of the deadliest among series of attacks carried out by Taliban terrorists in the last one month, the suicide bomb blast in Charikar city of Parwan province killed 26 people and left over 42 others injured. As per the police chief of Parwan province, a motorcyclist detonated a suicide bomb at a checkpoint leading to a rally where President Ashraf Ghani was addressing the public in central Parwan province. When the people were entering the police camp, an old man riding a motorcycle arrived on the highway and detonated his explosives, causing casualties. His dead body remains on the ground. Just over an hour later, another explosion went off in Kabul, near the Green Zone where the Defense Ministry, U.S. Embassy and NATO headquarters are located. The suicide bomb blast killed 22 people and left 38 others wounded. I was waiting at the entrance of the recruitment center when a man approached me and said, let me get inside. I was standing behind two men in the line when suddenly a blast occurred. In a statement claiming responsibility for both the blasts, Taliban spokesman Jabihullah Muzahid said the attack near Ghani's rally was deliberately aimed at disrupting elections scheduled for 28th September. We already warn people not to attend election rallies. If they suffer any losses, that is their own responsibility. Ghani, who was speaking to his supporters at the time of the explosion, remained unhurt and later condemned the attack, saying the incident proved the Taliban had no real interest in reconciliation. As the Taliban continue their crimes, they once again prove that they are not interested in peace and stability in Afghanistan. After killing more than 48 civilians in Parwan and Kabul, a Taliban suicide bomber along with two gunmen attacked a government's electronic identification registration center in Jalalabad, killing two civilians and leaving many injured. A day later, at least 20 people were killed and over 90 others suffered injuries in a truck explosion detonated by a Taliban suicide bomber near Kandhar Hospital in Khalat City of Afghanistan's Zabul province. Ever since U.S. officials have withdrawn from any further peace negotiations with Taliban, the number of attacks in Afghanistan has spiked. In just a week, Taliban terrorists have caused a large number of casualties among civilians and security forces in Afghanistan.
Meanwhile, Pakistan Prime Minister Imran Khan gauging an opportunity to rework its agenda of establishing Pak-backed Taliban regime in Afghanistan had announced to address UN General Assembly on reviving US-Taliban peace talks. While attending a ceremony at Pakistan's Tokram border crossing, he said, I assure you that we will use full force so that these dialogues proceed further. It is unfortunate that these peace talks were suspended. Pakistan's nefarious agenda behind its support of the US Taliban peace deal was later exposed at the United Nations Human Rights Council when Bilal Sarveh, a human rights activist from Afghanistan, accused Pakistan of supporting Taliban's Haqqani network and spreading terrorism in the war torn nation. President, Pakistan's army and its intelligence services provide institutional support to terrorist groups in Afghanistan. The support includes military-grade explosives, training and sanctuaries. In major Pakistani cities, there are madrasas where fighters are trained, recruited and hate speeches against Afghanistan and its international partners are prevalent. Funding is publicly raised in the name of jihad or holy war. The Pakistan-based militant network, the Haqqani Networks, famously described as the vertebral arm of the Pakistani intelligence service, the ISI, is responsible for some of the most deadliest terrorist attacks in my city, Kabul. Such horrific truck bombs, suicide attacks, and complex attacks have murdered innocent Afghans. Our cities, our schools, our clinics, our funerals, and our weddings have been targeted by these brutal and deadly terrorist attacks. The leader of the Haqqani Network, Sirajuddin Haqqani, is the deputy head of operations for the Taliban. He enjoys institutional support, sanctuary, and financial support from Pakistani army and intelligence services. The Haqqani Network has a generational, historical, and ideological relationship with Al-Qaeda. Pakistani-sponsored terrorism has resulted in the deaths of Afghan military, international aid workers, civilians, children, and very often entire families have vanished due to these attacks. Taliban terrorists largely supported and funded by Pakistan are agitated with the fall of peace deals between US and Taliban. They are waging attacks one after the other on Afghan civilians and security forces to create mayhem and dissuade citizens from participating in presidential election process. The US-Taliban peace deal would have played out benefactory to the foreign parties, but for Afghan citizens, either peace deal or no peace deal, both scenarios bring no accord. Pakistan is being called out globally for providing safe havens to terror groups. Recently, several members of European Parliament unanimously condemned the Islamic nation for providing shelter to terrorists. Elsewhere, in the ongoing 42nd session of UNHRC in Geneva, several human rights activists, research scholars and renowned journalists are slamming Pakistan every day for sponsoring terror activities from its territory. Also, Pakistan went through a major embarrassment this month when 10 members of Sri Lankan cricket team denied visiting the country for an upcoming bilateral cricket tournament. We bring you a compiled report. Pakistan state-sponsored terrorism continued to be the subject of global condemnation this week, not only in the ongoing UNHRC session, but also at the European Union Parliament. During a session on situation in Kashmir, several members of European Parliament called out Pakistan for providing sanctuary to terrorists and for promoting terrorism across LOC in India. India is the greatest democracy of the world and in the context of our democracy, I would say that it's our probably the only one ally in this part of Asia. And I believe we need to take a broader view. We need to look at terrorist acts that took place also in India and, and in Jammu and in Kashmir. And these terrorists, they didn't land it from the moon. They were coming from the neighboring country. We should see it against this background and we as European democracy should support democratic India. While Pakistan has been consistently denying its role in any kind of terror activity, various institutions and prominent personalities around the world are acknowledging India's firm stand that Pakistan is a breeder of terror outfits and hence a perpetrator of various innocent souls. 
Suwan al Denio, a researcher of European Foundation for South Asian Studies, slammed Pakistan in Geneva for its state-sponsored terrorism in South Asia. She asserted that terrorism has emerged as the worst forms of human rights violation in the region. Terrorism has emerged as one of the worst forms of human rights violations in the region, but it has not received its due attention from this council. The UN Security Council has designated the Taliban, the Akani Network, Lashkar-e Taiba, and Jaish e Mohammed as terrorist entities. These groups kill thousands annually and cripple the development of South Asia. Yet, they continue operating with the blessing of one common benefactor, the state of Pakistan. Two recent developments, the decision by U.S. President to terminate year-long peace talks with the Taliban and India's unilateral decision to revoke the special status of Indian Administrator Jammu and Kashmir may provoke dangerous misadventures from Pakistan. Given its track record, as well as the statements emanating from its top leadership, the likelihood of Pakistan perpetuating the cycle of violence in Afghanistan and Indian Administrator Jammu and Kashmir through its terrorist proxies is very high. The Asia-Pacific Group and the Financial Action Task Force have already sharpened their focus on Pakistan-sponsored terrorism in South Asia. Madam Vice President, I call upon this Council to do the same. Apart from diplomatic fronts, Pakistan has also received a major blow from sports arena as 10 Sri Lankan cricket players denied going to Pakistan for an upcoming bilateral cricket match between the two nations. The Sri Lankan team members, including Captain Dimwood Karunaratne and veteran Lasit Malinga and Angelo Matthews, have opted out of the upcoming tour of Pakistan over security concerns. They fear another terrorist attack on the team, which is quite obvious as the Sri Lankan cricket team has already suffered through a dreaded terrorist attack in the year 2009 on its tour to Pakistan. Pakistan cricket suffered a huge blow on March 3, 2009, when a group of terrorists attacked the Sri Lankan team bus and a minivan carrying officials near the Gaddafi Stadium in Lahore. In April 2009, Pakistan was dropped as a co-host of the 2011 World Cup. In May 2015, Zimbabwe became the first team to play an international fixture in Pakistan, but the tournament scared the Zimbabwe cricket team as a suicide bomber blew himself up outside the stadium where an ODI match was being played between the host and Zimbabwe. Time and again, Islamabad has suffered through major humiliations for being a terror hub. The embarrassments have not only come in global politics, but also in sports, especially cricket. After carrying out despicable terrorist attack in Sri Lanka, the deadly terrorist organization Islamic State has started inflicting terrorist attacks in Bangladesh. The terrorist group, with help of its widespread network, has been carrying out a number of terrorist attacks on police forces and civilians for last many months. Although the country has not suffered heavy casualties from the attacks. It certainly marks a gradual resurgence of Islamic State terrorism in Bangladesh. We have a report. Despite Bangladesh's zero tolerance policy towards terrorism in 2015, there has been a noticeable rise in terrorist activities witnessed in last many months. In the latest attack perpetrated by an Islamic State terrorist outfit in the capital city, Dhaka, Two policemen, along with a local political leader, were injured in a bomb blast. Hours after the incident, a US-based organization, Search for International Terrorist Entities, on the Twitter handle published that the Islamic State claims credit for the bomb blast on police in the Bangladeshi capital. It was the third attack on police forces in Bangladesh by Islamic State terror outfits this year. Early on April 29, two police constables were injured in a bomb attack in Golistan area of capital Dhaka. On 26 May, an assistant sub-inspector and two civilians were injured in a bomb attack targeting a police vehicle at the Malibhag intersection in Dhaka city. The litany of Islamic State terrorist activities in Bangladesh began from 2015 when different homegrown militant groups started claiming their allegiance with the terrorist organization. The, the Bangladesh has very serious problems about its own radicalized elements. 
So I think they need to keep a very strict curb on the jamaat e islami which is there, on the students' wing also which is there, and on the jamaat e the jamaatul mujahideen Bangladesh, uh, which is again a terrorist organisation. The most heinous terror attack carried by Islamic State was in July 2016 when five attackers opened fire inside a prominent holy artisan bakery located in the posh Gulshan neighborhood in Dhaka. Around 22 civilians and two police officers were killed in the attack. However, all five attackers were neutralized by the commando units of Bangladesh Armed Forces. The attack had plunged the country into a serious security threat. After Holy Artisan Cafe incident, in an unrelenting drive against terrorist groups and the supporters, Bangladesh security forces neutralized 100 terrorists and arrested 1,500 suspects across the country as per records of Bangladesh government officials. Although the massive counter-terrorism drive brought relative downfall in terrorist attacks across the country, it could not dissuade a certain group of extremist youths from holding allegiance with Islamic State. Why are the people getting radicalized? Because it is only once the person gets radicalized, the next step is a person picks up a weapon or explodes a bomb. Now, it is not the madrasas which are doing it there. Even when we are looking at the Gulshan Bakery, the people who did it, the, the, uh, the attackers, belong to the highest level of Pakistani society, uh, both in terms of prestige, in power and finances. So they were the richest of the rich people. They were the, the, they were the most powerful segment of society. And it was their children who did it. So obviously people are getting radicalized. And I think the Bangladesh government needs to look into this aspect of radicalization in a much more deeper and holistic manner. The recent Islamic State terrorist attacks carried out in the last few months hold testimony to gradual resurgence of terrorism in Bangladesh. And with that, we come to the end of this edition of Newsweek South Asia. We will be back next week with more news, views and analysis from the subcontinent. Meanwhile, do keep writing to us at nwsa at anin.com. This is Surbhi Sharma signing off on the behalf of the entire production team of Newsweek South Asia. Goodbye and take care. <laughs>